It's May 17th, the Norwegian National Day. But this isn't Norway. This is the state of Minnesota in the United States. A hundred years ago, there were no buildings here, but it wasn't empty. Different Indian tribes lived and hunted here. Then settlers came from Norway, Sweden, and Finland with all their belongings in wagons and boxes. A few stayed on and built Faustan, where the prairie meets the pines, the pines that were needed to build the houses. At Nord's gift shop, they sell Scandinavian handicrafts. But how do you get to Keith Johnson's farm? Make a left at Johnson Avenue and look out for a white mailbox, they say. It's easy to understand why the Scandinavians settled here. The landscape looks just like home. The road is lined with machinery needed on a modern farm. It was very different when the first Johnsons came from Norway at the end of the 19th century. Today, they have large fields and 150 cows but five generations have worked hard for it. This is Katie, the second oldest daughter, who is 16. She wants an education to get a job where she can travel. Anne, who by the way is half Swedish, runs the farm with her husband, and the cows are ready to be milked. Tim, who's 11, is going to be a farmer, but he's saving all his money for a boat. He wants to sail like the Vikings. The whole family has to help out, just like in the olden days. Otherwise, it wouldn't work out economically, says Keith. His parents, who are 80 years old, also help out. Scandinavians have always been known to be hard workers, and there's lots to do. Keith is actually opening up new fields, although many farms in the U.S. are closing down. of this land as the land of promise? Oh, I do. I like it. Yeah. America is a good place to be in. Uh, you're able to do, free to do anything you want, you know. So, within the law, of course, but, uh, you know, you can, you can start any business, you can farm, you can change your farm, you can build things, you can, uh, there's no very few restrictions on what you can do. The land of freedom, the great country in the West. People in Scandinavia heard about it, and many left because years of bad harvests had caused extreme poverty. Several hundred thousand families left Norway, Sweden, and Finland. 
The rumor was that there was land for everyone, just waiting to be farmed. But leaving was a big decision. The journey across the Atlantic was often difficult, with sickness and very little food. Many died before the ships reached New York after several months at sea. Then they started west to find a place to live, and most Scandinavians settled in the north. What kind of problems did the settlers run into? There was no roads. They just came in the wilderness, you know, and started. And they had to build themselves a house and uh, start from scratch, you know, right from nothing. And uh, my uh, grandfather, my great grandfather, is supposed to have carried a sack of flour all the way from Crookston, which is 50 miles, on his back, because there was no. Uh, when they first came, there was no flour mills around, and so they did a lot of walking and traveled by horses, and plowed up the land, you know, and cleared the stumps, picked the rocks, and uh, it was a, there was an awful lot of work. But it turned out good. They made a good living. And, uh, most of them did. The people that were willing to work hard yeah, made a good living, I think. They didn't get rich, but they had a nice place to be. Many of the immigrants, their religion was important. Whether they wanted the same kind of church that they'd come from or if they wanted to start a different kind of church, but they, it was important to them. And education was very important to them. They always wanted to they wanted their children to learn, and so schools and churches were the first things that went up after their own homes. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in my Religion is still important in Faustin and to the Johnsons. Katie takes part in the services, Anne sings in the choir. And Grandma Inga is the church librarian. Every Sunday, the whole family is in church. Here's five generations in just one picture. There's a great great grandma, and in 1882, the crops failed, and and. Uh, her husband wanted to move further west, but she was she wouldn't because she was afraid of the Indians like Sitting Bull. Oh, yeah. But then look at this picture where Grandpa and his brother were all dressed up as Indians. I wonder what she would have thought of that if she could have seen that. They're all dressed up like Indians. They're cute, though. Yeah. It's really cold and, st and snowy in Minnesota. And can you imagine having to shovel the roads out instead of having the snowplows to do all the work? That must have been a lot of work. But they did it. There's mom and dad getting married in 1968. Anne has made a photo album for each of her children with names of relatives and stories about their lives so the children would learn about their background. Are you proud of, uh, of your Scandinavian um, heritage? You bet. <laughs> Yes, a little bit slower. She's still gaining weight. Biology, a, next yeah, to history, is Tim's favorite subject. Today, his class is measuring how much their mice have grown. You start school when you're six, and you have to go until you're 16, in some states until you're 18, which means between 10 and 12 years. 
The quality of the schools varies a lot, and in the big cities, more and more students drop out. Five different grades are given, A, B, C, D, and F, which means fail. On the weekends, Katie works in an ice cream parlor called the Dairy Queen. If you work here, and you're the daughter of a dairy farmer, you can enter the Dairy Princess competition. Here the jury is interviewing Katie about her interests. The whole thing is mostly for fun, but it's still exciting. Well, Katie didn't become Dairy Princess, at least not this time. <laughs> but you can have fun in other ways. The big thing in Faustin is to take your father's car out for a Saturday spin. A couple of miles from the Johnson's farm is Indian land. For generations, Indians have lived here hunting and fishing. Before the settlers came, most Indians were nomads and different tribes controlled different areas. The Indians fought hard to keep their ancestors' land, but the settlers slowly pushed them back. They brought alcohol and new diseases that killed many Indians. And since the settlers farmed the land, the basis of the Indian economy was destroyed. These Indians at the Red Lake Reservation are among the few who can support themselves in the traditional way. According to the legend, Red Lake got its name after a large battle between two Indian tribes, the Sioux and the Chippewa. The battle was extremely violent, and the Chippewa pushed the Sioux out into the lake. The blood from the battle is said to have colored the lake red, and at times it does look reddish. Modern geologists say that it's because the bottom of the shallow lake is red sandstone.
the Red Lake Band were a closed reservation, which means we kept our land all, hen all held in common. We didn't take individual allotments way back when other tribes did and, and say, you know, you have this small section, you have this, and the rest is open for whomever wants to buy it or settle. We're very deeply rooted to our land both um, legally through our treaties, that it's, it's those treaties and this land that makes us Indians, that makes us um, different and, and separate from any kind of other ethnic minority. We have, we have um, treaties with the U.S. government which recognize us as our own government with, with the Tribal Council as our government and it is a government to government relationship. So I, th I think we're kind of like the last vestige of American Indians as, as survivors um, in spite of what happened in the settling of this country that um, the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians held on and, and is still trying to hold on to to the best of our traditions and to keep our culture alive. Judy Roy is Indian and in charge of Red Lake's tribal office. Many decisions about the reservation and its 5,000 Indians are made here. If you have at least one-fourth Indian blood, you may call yourself Indian. Today, there are close to 1.8 million Indians in the United States. <laughs> the reservation has its own hospital, church, schools, and even police. There's not much for young people to do on the reservation. The arcade is really the only place to go. Many young people are unemployed, and there are lots of people with drug or alcohol problems. Many adults have diabetes and are overweight, partly because of alcohol and partly because they eat differently than before. Back then, they mostly ate wild animals, fruits, and roots. And for the adults, there's bingo. It's good business for the reservation, because you're allowed to win more money on the reservation than outside, which attracts players from far away. There is an all-Indian high school on the reservation. When does the history of this book begin? This is American history. Look in your book. When does it start? What year? Um, Christopher Columbus found the New World in 1492. All right. Who was Columbus? He was a white European explorer. All right, he's a white European. And he, so American history begins when? When Columbus came. When Columbus came. Not when we started, when our history started. And we're Native people, right? If yeah. you look onto this, I have something in here that's a, it's a, a review of just the Indian people that live in this area. The pre Indians habitation. were here thousands of years before Columbus. And today, many Indians want to be called Native Americans, the first Americans. By learning about their own history, young Indians will hopefully feel proud of their background again. One common problem is that the history of the different tribes hasn't been written down, but in Red Lake, this has been done. Okay, when you want to make it a past tense, you just put your preverb on it and that makes it in the past form. Another way to bring young Indians closer to their cultural background is to teach them their own language. 
Today, only the older people speak Chippewa, since most parents wanted to teach their children English instead of Chippewa. Animate. Animate. Okay, this is pretty much easy one. Okay. Tessie is 16. In the Chippewa language, her name is Nebi Debik, which means is always near. But even if you're Indian, you have to learn about new technology to be able to make it in the modern world. There are about 285 Indian reservations in the U.S., and the Indians often got land that couldn't be farmed. The Red Lake Reservation is mostly forests and lakes. It belongs to the whole tribe, and everyone can hunt and fish. But the house where Tessie and her family live is their own. Okay, you see, you put it there and you put it over the point, mm -hmm. and you just twist it. Tessie's family holds on to the old traditions. Tessie's mother, Carol, is teaching a girl to make bells for dresses used in the powwow dance. The bells are made from tin cans. In the old days, mostly feathers were used. The bells are sewn onto the dress, and Tessie's dress has 500 bells that weigh several kilos altogether, making it quite heavy when you dance. What do you think about being an Indian? It, it's fun, and sometimes when you go places, it's kind of down because it's prejudiced, and some are racist and all that. But otherwise, it's fun and. I'm proud to be an Indian. How does it show that, this, that there are prejudices and racism? They act different towards you. In restaurants, that one restaurant in Bumiji, Perkins, I think that is. Me and my mom went in there and they didn't wait on us, so we just walked out. And they act very different when they're prejudiced against us. How is it to live in a reservation? Well, it's fun if you live in the right spot and all that, but otherwise, I'd rather be living someplace else. Why? There's not much here. Everybody's into, like, alcohol and drugs, and there's not much here for me to do. So I'd rather be someplace where there's much to do and all that. I'm, scared of, I'm sort of scared when I graduate because I want to get off this res and I'll sort of go someplace else. And, but I'll be scared when I leave this place. Why? Because I don't know what's out there, waiting to be found and all that. Tessie believes that the Great Spirit is everywhere. She can pray anywhere, but she often goes out to the big tree next to the house. Do you see me? Do you all help me? My words are tied in one with the great mountains, with the great rocks, with the great trees, and one with my body and my heart. Do you all help me with supernatural power? And you, day, and you, night, all of you see me one with this world. Across the road is the family burial ground. The graves are little houses where the dead have been put. This is my father's grave here. And this here is my mother's, mother's grave. And that is my grandfather's 
Library. They both, patients both died of heart, heart failure. We have two nights of wake, the burial on the third day. And that doesn't stop there. We still have four mornings and four evenings that we have to build a fire because their journey takes four days. And they, those four fires in the morning is for them to warm up when you're, before they travel. You're walking earth here, but where you're going is a better life happier life, a younger life, no pain, no suffering. Augie Nash, Thunderbird, explains that tobacco is important when the Chippewa worship their ancestors and the Great Spirit. When you take your uh, smoke inside your body, you're saying a prayer at the same time. You're asking God for something. Then you let out the smoke. And the smoke goes up to God, the Great Spirit. Then you twist this around and you pass it on to the next person. And they, and they smoke it. All goes around. The powwow used to be held in the spring to celebrate the return of life and to thank the ancestors and the Great Spirit. Today, there are many powwows, and it's a way to get together and have a good time. Here are Carol and John, Tessie's parents, dressed in their finest powwow clothes, 